Hi, this is Phil Newman of Longevity Technology, and I'm joined today by one of the most interesting and uh, vocal scientists in the field of longevity today, Dr. Charles Brenner. Charles. Great to see you. Charles, let's talk about your uh, opinions now on where we are in this progression of our field of longevity, both in terms of public perception and, of course, we're at the Longevity Investors Conference today, so investor perception of longevity as well. Well, it's an extremely exciting time in science. Um, in terms of whether there's huge breakthroughs in longevity research, I think there's a real disconnect between what the public thinks and what is actually happening. I mean, the public thinks that there are dominantly active uh, longevity genes and that there are activators of these genes and that partial reprogramming works. And um, partial reprogramming is really in its infancy. We don't know whether it works and is safe in, in vivo. Dominant longevity genes don't exist. Activators of those genes don't exist. So there's really kind of a disconnect right now. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel that uh, that disconnect can be fixed? I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you are famous for your opinions. So it'd be interesting to understand how you feel we can bridge that. Well, the thing is, people do need to understand that uh, lifespan is genetically encoded. It's different in different animals. And the drivers of longevity have to do with reproduction. Right, so there's a real strong selection for genes that allow us to survive and get food and avoid predation, find a mate, reproduce and have babies, maybe have babies multiple times and protect those babies until they can find their own food and avoid predation. But there isn't really a direct selection for longevity. And so longevity is really an emergent property of our gene sets and it's not something that's easily engineered. Let's talk about um, CRISPR gene editing and so on. What do you feel about that as a technology and its interventions associated with longevity? So that's, that's just, just the thing, right? So if there were simple, dominantly acting longevity genes, then CRISPR would change a lot, right? Because we could CRISPR in you know, our favorite gene. But if, if it turns out that longevity is highly polygenic, which it is, then we don't know what to CRISPR. You'd have to CRISPR in alleles of hundreds or thousands of different genes. And so that's why it's, it's such a hard problem. The best interventions for longevity have always been public health, right? Cleaning up the water, the food, um, having physical activity, vaccination, avoiding gun violence, right? And um, so there hasn't actually been anything better than exercise and good hygiene that has been developed through medicine to this date. So let's think, you mentioned earlier about um, uh, cellular reprogramming. There yep. are a lot of things happening in the space now that are getting a lot of cash and a lot of attention. Um, epigenetics, of course, uh, are there. We all understand them now as, a, as an industry and what they mean. What are your thoughts on, on those right, two? Right, right. So again, the biology is really exciting. And um, we know that these four Yamanaka factors can, can be introduced into a cell so you can take a, an old cell from me or you and put it into the laboratory, put these factors in, and you can set the, the clock right back, right? But when you're in the laboratory, you're also getting a lot of other events, right? You're getting cells that die, you're getting cells that form tumors, you're getting cells that form teratomas. And in the laboratory, people are getting rid of all of those cells, right? So in vivo reprogramming has been done in mice, but then it's only been measured by looking at measures of epigenetics, right? It's not been shown really to be safe because the numbers have been so small of, of, of mice and it's not been shown to functionally restore or extend the lifespan of, every, of any animal. So that it's, it's an exciting idea, but um, it's very early days in that, in that regard. So let's talk about um, technologies that are available in public today. So yep. you've got uh, nicotinamide riboside, you're very famous for that. What are yep. your thoughts on this as a uh, intervention for longevity today? Yeah, so I don't call it a longevity drug, but um, NAD is the central catalyst of metabolism. Me metabolism is kind of the life force of what we are and what we do, and it declines in aging, and our, our resiliency and our ability to repair declines in aging. So there are 50 you know, ongoing clinical trials. There's been you know, positive signals in Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative conditions, uh, potentially nearly a, a positive signal in, in fatty liver. Um, it's clearly anti-inflammatory. 
Um, I'd like to see uh, placebo-controlled trials in, we look, in which we look at uh, wound repair, because that's a discrete thing that we can measure. You know, I don't think that you can really do a, a lifespan trial itself, and I'm not entirely convinced by the trials that are only measured by biomarker reversion. Because once again, if your intervention is acting on the epigenetic machinery, then just reversing that machinery doesn't tell you anything functional. So it's, again, it's an exciting time for NAD and there's a lot of uh, safety trials and, and functional trials that are in process. And what are, what are you working on at the moment, Charles, that kind of you get out of bed in the morning and think, today I'm going to do that, and that's exciting. Yeah, well, we also have a rare disease involving NAD that we're looking at. Uh, we're interested in repair resiliency pathways. We've seen effects in maternal health and uh, maternal neonatal health and rodents that we'd like to be able to translate. So there's a lot of exciting things going on with NR. Great. There's the Maximum Longevity Prize being announced today for translational science. What are your thoughts on, on that and the, the state of the uh, new entrance into the sector? Um, I wish them all luck. Um, they've got to have clear go, no-go decisions, falsifiable hypotheses, and they've got to deal with the complexity of longevity being a highly multi-gene thing that is not going to be a simple engineering problem. Charles, thanks for joining us today. All right, my pleasure. Thanks.